When I was in junior high, I went to practice martial arts in a pink uniform. It didn't start out pink. My white tobok got washed with some cheap red t-shirts I got in school for Spirit Week. But now my brother and I became the pink Power Ranger. Something was always a little bit off with our uniforms. If it wasn't dyed pink, the sleeves were too short, or the pants cuffs were a little bit frayed. But the real problem was not with my uniform, it was with my body. I trained three days a week for two years and got all the way to red black belt, but I never developed the balance, flexibility, muscle control to master any of the complicated kicks. When I sparred and practiced, my only options were the front snap kick or the roundhouse kick. My side kick was too slow and my butt stuck out and I was off balance. My axe kick didn't rise high enough or fall quick enough to be a threat. My spinning hook kick was just thrown blindly uh, with no control. I never expected to hit anyone. I just did it for kicks. I deserved to be at most, at most, a green belt. But I was not just a disciple of the martial arts. I was also a paying customer. I went month after month and took test after test. And I got promoted from white to yellow, yellow to orange, to purple, to green, to blue, to brown, to red, and red-black. When I was a brown belt, Master Kim called me Circus Bear, shaking his head. Kom gatan inom, is what he said. I was Kung Fu Panda before Jack Black. I was lumbering through the movements with none of the crispness or power that a brown belt should have had. Brown belt, that's about when I started feeling like a liar at the dojang. I then advanced to red and then to red-black, and with each promotion, my angst only grew. I'm unworthy. I'm a fraud. I would fantasize about going over to my master, admitting that I didn't deserve my belt, and asking to start over. It would be great to be demoted to a level that I was actually better than. It was my secret fantasy to be demoted all the way to white belt because I would have been the best white belt ever. And I could practice honestly at that point, analyzing exactly where I was inadequate, working to develop the strength, flexibility, and control to perfect each move in succession. But as long as I was wearing my brown belt or my red belt or my red black belt, I couldn't ask for help for skills I was already supposed to know. I wanted to do it right, but I never had the courage to admit openly that I was a fraud. I half hoped that somebody would call me out, you're not a red black belt. I wanted to kind of hear, but no one ever did. I kept going, kept advancing, but never got any better. No one stopped me because no one was serious about me becoming a disciple of the way of the foot and fist. I could do a plausible rendition of the Pumsa forms, and I had spent enough time in the program, and for most people, that was enough. So if somebody tells me he or she is a black belt, I think, eh, that's nice, I'm almost one too. I don't raise my expectations that much about anyone. It doesn't tell me that that person has the quick eyes needed to referee a match, or the moves and stamina to fight, the person having a blood belt just means that he or she stuck around and participated, going through the motions for at least two years. And if someone tells me that he or she is a Christian leader, I think, that's nice. <laughs> but I don't raise my expectations too much because that doesn't tell me whether that person actually has the knowledge to explain the Christian message clearly and persuasively. Or whether that person has the character to be trusted with the care of fragile hearts. The person being called a Christian leader just means he or she stuck around for a couple of years and participated. I think that some of you recognize that you are Christian leaders and you felt like stepping down or rejecting the title because you felt unqualified. But you just keep on going because no one calls you out, no one stops you, because no one feels like is serious about making sure that you're a follower of the way of Jesus Christ. Lots of us here are black belts. If you're a deacon, you're claiming to be a black belt. If you're a Sunday school teacher, that's claiming to be a black belt. If you're on praise team, if you are serving in any capacity, you're saying, 
black belt, follow me as I follow Christ. You're claiming to know what you're doing so that you can be a role model for somebody else. But what are the skills that you're supposed to have mastered? What abilities are supposed to be evident in your life? Today's passage is a description of what black belt discipleship to Jesus looks like. The point of studying today's text is not to bemoan our status or to point fingers at anyone else for not measuring up. It's to see that there is a description of what mature faith looks like and that it's also a prescription to provide us with a correct training regimen. When we see how we're supposed to train, and if we begin to train correctly in time, we will actually become disciples who know how to fellowship and worship to the glory of Christ. Let's begin with verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. That is the first part of the verse I want to talk about. We misunderstand Christian discipleship because we act as if letting the word of God dwell richly among us means that we have small groups once in a while. And I know that while the word of God is being talked about at a New Hope Church small group, it is not dwelling in us richly. We are too safe and too polite in small group. What we do in small group is kind of like cardio kickboxing. What Paul means by teach and admonish one another is hardcore Muay Thai, where you look, you really look at the other person, and you try to break through that person's guard so that the word gets through. You have to be passionate for the word of God getting through to one another. If you've ever sparred with someone at your skill level or higher, you know that it's really easy to block. It's really hard to strike and connect. You have to, if you want to connect, you have to offer your best focus, and you also have to offer prayers asking for God to be present in that moment. By the power of the Holy Spirit, allow us to talk about the Word in a way that causes us to change. It's being attentive to your place in that meeting and being attentive to the Holy Spirit's presence in that meeting that allows this miracle to take place. That is how we do more than our best. It's how we, it's the only way we experience the word of Christ dwelling in us richly as we teach and admonish each other. But I don't want you to all of a sudden take the metaphor too far and start beating each other up with Bible verses. In fact, the words of Christ are rarely harsh. The two most repeated commands in scripture, what do you think they are? What is God always telling us to do? He's saying, do not be afraid. And he's saying, rejoice. And that's the message that you're supposed to take and apply to that person's life, breaking through their guard and touching their hearts with it. I'm reminded of a scene in the movie, Good Will Hunting. This scene on the DVD is actually titled, It's Not Your Fault. And if you've watched the movie, you know what scene I'm talking about. In the scene, Sean, who is a court-mandated psychologist for Will, who was a troubled young man who was abused as a child, um, Sean in the scene is speaking not as a therapist, but as a kindred spirit who has developed a bond with Will. He looks at Will fully, unapologetically, attentively. And Sean, he says, it's not your fault. All that abuse that's in your file, it's not your fault. And Will typically bats the words away, his guard up, not letting the words come into his heart. But Sean presses in, delivering the message, it's not your fault, Will, again and again until the truth finally breaks through Will's guard and healing is delivered. Sometimes we're called to teach and admonish in that way directly. And sometimes we're called to be less direct, just create the opportunity for the other person to learn by asking them questions and creating the space for the Holy Spirit to lead them into truth while we listen and care for them. But the most important part is having faith in the life-changing power of God's Word and to be in the discussion with the expectation to witness transformation. When you went to small group, 
were you thinking like, oh, I'm going to just be polite to people? Or were you thinking, the word of God is here and the word of God is going to change lives today? What were you thinking? That's the problem with most Christian activity. We lack faith that our lives will change. We lack the intention for the fellowship to work towards our lives changing as we talk about God's word. We do small group the way I used to do push-ups when I did taekwondo. Master Kim would call out, get down and give me 30. And we would all do 30 push-ups, but it would be my neck moving up and down. It would be my butt moving up and down, but my arms would not be bending because a push-up is designed to hurt. It's designed to create stress on certain muscle groups so that if they're not in shape, you can't do them. If you try to do them, it hurts. I did my push-ups, which looked from a distance like a normal push-up, but when I did my push-up, I wasn't actually putting any strain on my body. I did years of training, and when I was confronted by my cousin at the end of my training, he said, how many push-ups can you do? I said, you know, sometimes in Taekwondo class, he assigns us 100. I could do 100 in an hour. And he's like, do one. <laughs> I could not do one perfect push-up as a brown belt. That was the beginning of my <laughs> existential crisis in martial arts. Small group should involve transformation and small group should put strain on our souls almost to the point of pain, revealing what is weak and undeveloped. Let's not settle and just look like we're having small group. Let's truly train with every small group opportunity. Amen? Amen. There is a second part to verse 16 and it deals with the way we worship. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. I hope none of you are offended, but here it comes. What we usually do in worship is similar to playing for a lease on piano like a dutiful fifth grader practicing the song for the hundredth time. Let me repeat that. What we usually do in a Sunday worship service is similar to playing for a lease on piano, doo -doo 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 like a dutiful fifth grader practicing the song for the hundredth time. There's nothing horribly wrong about it, but there's not that much right about it either. What Paul means by singing spiritual songs to God is like playing for a lease on piano like Beethoven with feeling in the pacing and with intention in each phrase. We're supposed to sing with gratitude to God. The worship that we lift up is supposed to convey gratitude to God, but we are terrible at worship because we go through life feeling so little gratitude. We are too busy feeling undervalued, unappreciated to feel any gratitude towards God. Our hearts do not cry out, you are worthy, because our hearts are preoccupied with a complaint, I do too much. When my wife was away, I did more cooking at home. And when I cooked, I realized that it's really hard to pray, thanking God for the food you're about to eat, when you just cook that food, after having grocery shop for that food, paying for that groceries with money that you earned. I did too much for me to feel gratitude towards God. I was wondering, what exactly am I supposed to feel grateful for? I did everything. Unless we exercise spiritual discipline, we become blind to all the grace that surrounds us and our soul becomes numb and the only thing that we feel is frustration. There is actually a lot to be thankful for when you're about to eat food, like taste buds or the fact that we're not part of the food chain. Isn't it awesome that we get to eat but nothing eats us? These are amazing, awesome truths that we don't appreciate. We just think, I do so much. That is why we must do things that humble us because humility is what prepares us to sing grateful songs to God. What humbles you? What humbles me is seeing people who serve God with greater devotion than I do. When I was like 
the most devoted to God, the most just earnestly offering my life to God. I had, there was a time when I spent four months in Cambodia in 2005. I was a seminary student. I took a semester off. I served God in Cambodia for four months. It was so hot. It was winter in Cambodia, and it was still so hot. And I was saying, God, for you, I sweat. And we would literally take towels, drench them in cold water, and go to sleep with those as blankets, saying, God, help me get to sleep, so that the stickiness is not something I endure for hours at a time. I was there just four months. Missionary Jung Soo Kim was there three years before me. He got there in 2002, and he is still there serving Jesus, raising disciples. You know, Facebook is a curse to us all the time because I tend to get indignant at what people less deserving than me are enjoying. I'm like, what? What? You doing this? I'm so much more deserving than you. Why are you doing this? But Facebook is a blessing to me when I look at missionary Jung Soo Kim's Facebook page because it has the power to humble me when I dare to check in on what my missionary mentors are doing in Cambodia. There they are, continuing to pastor, encourage, coach, and bless the Bible Academy students that I taught 14 years ago. Over those 14 years, they were there for them getting married, they were there for the birth of their children, they were there to help them launch their churches, and they were there to coordinate regional events. And I'm there seeing their daughter grow up, going from the three-year-old that I had met to the 17-year-old now. And as I scroll through that timeline, I am humbled. I am literally invited to fall to my knees as I have a moment of humility considering what others do for Jesus. I am also humbled by beauty. I have walked in on sacred moments when my daughter radiates like sleeping beauty. This is truly the work of God because normally she does not radiate. <laughs> She's sleeping and it's like I can sense God's heart saying, this is my daughter with whom I'm well pleased, love her. And my heart says, yes, yes, I will. And in that moment, I can't just walk away because if I do, the warm, fuzzy feelings vanish like mist in the wind. I need to literally fall to my knees and pray in that moment. Unfortunately, many, many weeks, I don't stumble upon these special moments but I know I can still choose humility through choosing to fast and also choosing to exercise prayerfully. When I was restless and my pride was so raging that I couldn't stifle the criticism I felt towards others, I found that in Cambodia, fasting was an effective means of becoming humble. Fasting is tricky because sometimes when I'm just hungry, I am extra cranky, extra selfish. But when it's done with prayer, sometimes I could feel my heart getting an oil change. It's like the fasting is unscrewing a cap and all of this dark gunk just comes out. I am being drained of all of my pride and entitlement to be filled later as I worship. That makes it sound like I fast a lot. I don't fast that often. I more often choose to exercise. I run to the point of exhaustion, which for me is about two and a half miles. Or I hike to the point of getting lost and as the sun is fading. Slowly through this time, I am sweating out pride and I'm breathing out my entitlement. And step by step, as I run, I find myself able to find my way back to humility. I remember that every beat of my heart is grace. Getting home safely is grace. Every shower is grace. Every bite of food, every hour of sleep is grace. And most importantly, in that humbled attitude, every verse of scripture becomes grace. The point is that through our choices, we control what we feel towards God. That is why Jesus rebukes the church in the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. He says, you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. He's saying, 
you no longer feel for me the gratitude and the adoration you once did. Therefore, repent and do the works that you did at first, the works that allowed you to begin to feel humble, feel grateful, feel worshipful again. We need to repent and do the works during the week that prepare us for Sunday worship. Don't come to church and ask the church service to make you feel something for God. You need to come ready. Do what you need to do during the week so that your heart is humble and recognizes the grace of God in your life. Do QT as you are catching up on newsletters from missionaries. Run until you sweat out all of your entitlement and pride and then do QT. Get up early and look at your family and then go do QT. Do QT and fast like your spiritual life depends on it. Get your heart ready. Then with gratitude in your heart that comes from humility, sing to God. Once you are sensitive to God's grace, your music will no longer be meaningless duty. Every phrase will be filled with meaning and feeling. Our singing will become pleasure to the ear of God. And those who step into our midst will know that the word of Christ is dwelling in us richly. After such singing to God, there will be a greater power in teaching that comes from the pulpit. And then that will in turn lead to a more grateful singing towards God. As a result, we will become disciples of Jesus who are able to effectively disciple others. Our lives will change and God will use us to help others change. But when we worship to change our mood or use fellowship to catch up with our friends, we are being weak, ineffective, untrained Christian leaders. We are like black belts who know how to do the forms but who don't know how to effectively spar. We can still impress people who have really, really low standards. After all, training sloppily is better than not training at all. I find that worship music by osmosis makes me a little bit less evil when I'm driving. I am a little bit more patient at uh, dealing with people um, and they consider me more nice because I have worship around me. Because during our fellowship time, we share a prayer request with one another because it's one of the forms of Christian conversation. People who don't do any of this look at us and think, wow, your friendships run deep. Your conversations are deeper than I thought. But they are not going to exclaim that surely God is in your midst. No one is going to show up to worship service and see the way we sing and be like, wow, surely God is in our midst when there is no gratitude towards God in our hearts that we access through humility during the week. No one is going to come to a small group meeting and think, surely God is in this place as we have small group with one another when it's just casual catching up with friends. To the world, we demonstrate nothing more significant than a typical yoga class. To the world, the typical CrossFit community is more compelling than the local church. What we do is better than nothing, but we are not showing off the power of God to transform human hearts and human relationships. And that is why we must do better. What will convince the world that something special is happening in our midst? I think the world will notice if we manage to do in our family life what verse 18 through 21 describes. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the... I should stop smiling. As is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is your acceptable duty in the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children or they may lose heart. When the battle hymn of the tiger mother was published, our culture noticed and they looked into Asian family dynamics because they were impressed that tiger momming seemed to cause children to obey their parents in everything and to do their duty with excellence. However, such tactics, I know, cause crippling emotional scars on those high achievers, and the intergenerational relationships are marked by lifelong resentment. But what if the church could show how to raise obedient children 
while also showing how we could truly be loving parents? What if women in the church were especially equipped in our culture to respect and submit to their husbands, and the men in the church were prepared to love their wives, control their anger, and serve them sacrificially? Wouldn't people flock to church? I think the answer is yes. That's why sermon series on marriage or raising children are so popular. Why then am I preaching on quiet time and not about marriage or raising children? The reason is that I believe that verse 18 to 21, which describes the family relationships for the Christian, and verses 22 to 25, which describe work and social relationships for the Christian, are simply telling us the outcome, the outcome that we would see naturally if we would just do verse 16 and 17. When the word of Christ dwells in us richly, children obey their parents and fathers don't frustrate their children. The word of Christ dwelling in us results in Bible-blessed relationships. I testify that it's true. I have caught a glimpse because something amazing happened in my family recently. The day started typically with me frustrated at my daughter and my daughter really, really frustrated with me as I tried to get her to commit to a weekly schedule. A weekly schedule with free time, boredom busters, getting ready for bed, chores, sleep time. I tried to get her to commit to these things because I wanted her to be, just be better, be better, Abby, be better. And she said, no, no, get off my back, no. It was exhausting for me to not be abusive to my daughter. I have such anger management issues that it takes a lot of my energy to stay within the bounds of not being abusive. But even though I'm so broken, I witnessed a miracle. What happened was, after Abby and I exhausted each other with our fight, later that night, my wife asked my daughter, Abby, will you help mommy do quiet time? And my daughter and my wife were reading the Bible together when it passed by them. And it literally brought me to my knees. As the word of Christ dwells in my family, I began to see that my daughter naturally began to obey, not because I caused her to submit, but because the word of God had dwelled close to her. She was just getting ready for bed after doing quiet time. I was so humbled. I have decided to claim for myself that the word of Christ dwelling in my family will result in these Bible-blessed relationships. That is the promise that I sense. Which made me wonder, why did it take me so long to begin to experience this? Because for the five years before I came to New Hope, I got up to be on the bus at 5.30 to be in New York in time for morning prayer, and I preached for morning prayer multiple times every week. I did so much QT ministry in New York City, and all those years, whenever I said to Abby, Abby, do you want to do quiet time with Daddy? She would always say, nope. Why was she starting to do quiet time now? Why are we beginning to see the promise of Bible-blessed relationships now? I think part of the reason is that I am spending more time at home. I am doing um, just more fathering. But also a part of it is that I am doing QT at home now instead of at the office or just with church folks. It made me wonder, why haven't I been doing more QT at home? And it's because I get credit in the way I score myself. I get credit for being a good pastor when I do QT with others or QT in the office But whatever is happening at home, I don't get those points for, those useless points that control my life. If I did that at the office, I kind of got the sense that people would know and that it was me being effective as a pastor. But verse 17 of today's passage says, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. To do something in the name of Jesus means to do it for Jesus' sake and by Jesus' provision. And for most of my life, I'm realizing I do QT 
by my strength for the sake of my reputation. But I'm beginning to glimpse the promise that when the word of Christ dwelling richly in my home is really for Jesus' sake and by Jesus' blessing, then our family will begin to experience more of Bible-based, Bible-blessed relationships. So it is my desire to do QT at home, not to prove that I'm good at my job, but because I want the blessings that come from having the word of Christ flow richly in my house. It's all connected. When I aim to do quiet time every day, not just to check it off as a list of chores I have to do for the day, but to invite the Holy Spirit to come into my home and fill each of us, our character changes, and we will experience that blessing in our relationship. And then as I go to church with a testimony of how God is blessing me and how I earnestly desire for others to be blessed, I will be admonishing and teaching with greater faith. And as I am so encouraged and grateful for the way God is faithful in my life, my heart becomes grateful and sings to God in worship, then God, he is dwelling with us more richly. When we begin to have real black belt faith, we have real Bible-blessed relationships. May my inheritance be my reward. May revival begin with me. And may it be that my testimony and yours as we commit to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, echoes that which Paul writes in verses 23 and 24. Whatever your task, put yourselves into it as done for the Lord, since you know that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You serve the Lord Christ. With these words in mind, would you pray with me? God, help us to do everything for you. And because we do it for you, help us to be real about it. Help us to give to you every fellowship, every worship, with the faith that you can change lives. And with the expectation that our lives will change directly as a result of these meetings. Help us to do things with great faith, allowing the word of God to dwell in us richly, allowing our lives to reflect the blessing that comes from the Bible permeating our relationships. May this be done for our satisfaction and your glory. These things we pray in Christ's name.